So that's what I'm saying. The text is like an object. It's going to change perspective based on where you're standing. I don't know. Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me? I missed you, baby sweet. It was a day. Hmm. It was a day. Please tell me you're seeing this too. From Seattle, we are drinking the movies. I'm Taylor Baker. Joining me is Anna Harrison. Our resident Marvel correspondent is here to talk about everything but Marvel today. Uh, how have you been doing, Anna? Well, I'm really sad that I don't have anything to talk about with Marvel, honestly. Big bummer. Um, other than that, doing peachy. Doing peachy. Have you enjoyed the uh, new releases in the last two months since the year's turned? Yeah. I'm trying to like cycle through them in my head. Yeah, you know pretty good uh no i have not seen anything atrociously bad so that's been nice which is kind of surprising for this time of year normally we get horrendous films released uh, kind of this drop-off window where studios just kind of exit their project that they know doesn't work yeah yeah that's unfortunate um we're gonna do some first impressions as always today the first of which is gonna be the northman Starring Nicole Kidman and Alexander Skarsgård. Uh, let's get to it. I will avenge you, father. I will save you, mother. I will kill you, father. Why would you stow away to such a hellish place? To find what was stolen from me. And what is that? The kingdom. You must choose between kindness for your kin or hate for your enemies. Your strength breaks men's bones. Ah! I have the cunning to break their minds. Ah! And night by night, we will carry out my pledge of vengeance. I will avenge you, father. I will avenge you, father. <laughs> All right, Anna, that was the trailer for Robert Eggers' The Northman. Other than the fact that it looks pretty dang awesome, what do you think? <laughs> well, I think it looks pretty dang awesome. I think it looks sick. Um, great cast. Uh, I don't know. It looks... I So I haven't seen The Witch, but it looks... I mean, I, I don't know. That I've seen The Lighthouse. An um, oversight by you. I, I have a lot of oversights, okay? <laughs> but it looks... I mean... I. Again, I, so I haven't seen The Witch, but I've seen The Lighthouse, but judging from what I know, it looks to be much bigger scale than what Robert Eggers has done before. Um, and so I'm really excited to see how he handles that. But it, I mean, it, look, it looks great. I don't know what I can say. It looks like right up my alley. Yeah, it, it's as visually distinctive as his other films. I think that's what surprised me the most. As this was in production, um, we kind of heard rumors about how large the scale was. And comparatively to The Witch, um, which is arguably a, a little bit smaller in scale, even though there's more characters than The Lighthouse, it, it just kind of doesn't seem intuitive for a, a man who's demonstrated such mastery of a single location to go spanning. So it's an exciting evolution in his filmography, but it's kind of stunning just how visually distinctive and controlled and meticulous everything continues to look you know the likening between him and Ari Aster kind of continues as they build their filmographies and expand with their risks they're both working kind of in the same um mode but their uh their flourishes are very very different and it's exciting to watch these two make some yeah. of the most exciting films <laughs> yeah Anya Taylor-Joy is a great uh witch like sorceress person oh she just has that like ethereal vibe you know yeah that um uncanniness where you can't really mm -hmm. place uh whether or not she is magical or not um mm -hmm. it, it's great to see them reteam and it's interesting that she uh at least through the marketing was presented to have those sorceress like powers so that's yeah, exciting intriguing mm -hmm. um the, the cast otherwise alexander skarsgård nicole kidman i think i saw bjork in there mm -hmm. um Ethan Hawke gets killed off quickly. Yeah, yeah, Willem Dafoe returns for what appears to be a, a pretty brief uh, character role. 
Um, what did you think of all those different characters as you saw them? Yeah, I mean, the first bit of the tra- I mean, the first bit of the trailer does, I you know, it feels like it spoils like the opening 10, 15, 20 minutes of the movie where it's like, okay, Ethan Hawke is dead, uh, killed by his uncle. And that's what spurs the plot of the movie. Um, but I'm sure he'll be great in his limited screen time. And I'm sure everyone else will be great. Um, Alexander Skarsgård looks exactly like I would imagine some Viking dude to look like. Um, Willem Dafoe is great. I like will quote uh, from The Lighthouse when he's like, uh, oh, what's that quote where he's like, are you saying you don't like me lobster? I say that all the time. And everyone's like, what are you talking about, Anna? I'm like, yeah, it's great. I don't know. I'm excited for him to reteam. It's He's fantastic. See, see if he has a chance to deliver one of those lines. Yeah, I think the Ethan Hawke um, being shown in the trailer obviously potentially ruins the exposition, but this might be a film where there's visions right. of yeah. of him talking to his son or um, just like perhaps Mufasa. flashbacks. It's just like the Lion King. Yeah, Ethan Hawke is Mufasa. I, I, He's a dude killed by his uh, brother, and then his son is going on a quest, and he might see him in visions. It's just and like Nala is a witch. It's just like yeah. Lion. Yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, all right. Well, if there's nothing else, let's get on to Boz Lerman's Elvis. I watched that skinny boy transform into a superhero. wish to promote you, Mr. Presley. Boardroom party in the town of jail. Are you ready to fly? I'm ready. Ready to fly. All right, Anna, that was the trailer for Boz Lerman's Elvis. What do you think? I am intrigued to see Austin Butler. Uh, just because, you know, he was like a Disney Nickelodeon kid. And obviously, I mean, he was in Once Upon a Time in Hollywood and he's been doing more... Uh, heavy heavier roles but i feel like i i am not a an austin butler groupie so i might be wrong but i feel like this is his first kind of adult leading role uh you know especially from a director as big as boz lerman so i'm very intrigued i mean he looks like he's gonna be really good um but i don't know i just I, i'm i'm curious in a good way um in an optimistic way to see how that pans out uh I, don't know, I feel like recently we've gotten a lot of these Disney or Nick stars, former child stars that have really made some interesting choices and have actually like not just kind of, I don't want to say gone off the deep end, but not just like petered out, you know, they were actually mm-hmm. like built a career. So I'm very, I'm very intrigued to see him in this role. And, you know, Boz Lerman always makes big choices for, for better or for worse. So I'm sure it'll be, a ride you know no matter the outcome <laughs> he, he does make enormous uh choices I, I like to think of them as enormous gaudy roller coaster rides um i don't know anything about austin butler i had never heard that name before i don't think i was familiar um with any of his work outside of recognizing him and equating it with once upon a time in hollywood so uh, i'm brand new to the to him as a performer and i too am pretty impressed by what he was um showing us here there's a lot of um in the trailer that that signifies that they're actually going to build up the history of elvis and who he developed his act from and what his influences were which i think is a good um choice by Mm boss to make yeah i think it's so much more interesting to me to have these biopics especially ones about musicians i don't know i'm thinking about rocket man which is a, in you know in a bunch of ways it is a standard biopic, but then it, in a lot of different ways it's very different, and it tries to be to like tap into that energy of Elton John and his songs and everything, and it looks like this is going to be kind of in that same vein of like really not just like a cookie cutter thing that's really trying to make bolder choices and elevate uh, that that elevate the story that it's trying to tell. Yeah, yeah, it's um, 
I, I know that Rami won for Bohemian Rhapsody, but as a whole, I don't think that film really works. Yeah, and... I, was, I was trying not to mention that by name, but I'm still really bitter that like Bohemian Rhapsody got all those awards and then next year, Rocket Man and Taron Edgerton got like nothing. I'm Be- still really mad about it, but it's fine. It's whatever. Yeah, I think it's because Bohemian had just yeah. won all yeah. that stuff that voters didn't vote the same. But um, yeah. it, it's Losers. kind of doing a comparison. It's, um, you, you know, even if we go with the, the better version, which is Rocket Man, even though that is a little bit ostentatious and a, and a little bit glamoury, like what Boz is doing here is really, I think, celebrating all the best parts of Elvis. And he's kind of dressing up even the, the negative sides. And mm-hmm. I don't get a sense from the, the trailer that we were shown that we're going to get into the downfall um, mm-hmm. of Elvis. So I, I do think it's kind of it, it's going to be fun in its reverence at the very least. Yeah. Also, Tom Hanks and those prosthetics. Wow. I don't know what to make of that. Um, we we will see when the film comes out. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Was there anything else you wanted to go over with Elvis or should we get on to Steven Soderbergh's Kimmy? We can get on. All right. What do you want from me? Kimmy? I'm here. Why don't you run from me? Call Darius. Hey, hotness! Wow. What are you wondering? What do you know? Kimmy? I'm here. Reopen last stream on desktop. I need more kitchen paper. Open yesterday's stream. I'm a voice stream interpreter. I may have heard a crime on one of the streams. The devices pick up lots of things. Just mark this degraded audio and delete it. All right, Anna. Kimmy, starring Zoe Kravitz. What do you think? I think it was pretty good. I have to say I was very, I don't know, anything. I don't really want to watch a movie that has anything to do with COVID. So when I knew, when I read that it was set, you know, right now during COVID times, I was like, I don't want to, please God, no. I already have too much stress from this in my own life. I don't need my movie to also have it. I'll, whatever. But I think, um, it, I, I think it handled it in a really good way and I was not at all put off by how they presented it. I thought it was a very taut, precise movie and good fun. Yeah. yeah. Um, we both attended an incredibly large amount of film festivals over the last 12 months. And at those festivals, we've come across tons of COVID films and nearly 99% of them are terrible. And I have um, avoided all of them on purpose. Oh, I, di- I didn't realize that you'd pulled that off. Uh, oh, yeah. So, so Kimmy is the first, I, I'd say, feature film, um, fiction feature film that has pulled off being in the contemporary environment passively without making it a focus mm-hmm. and just existing and showing us kind of just day-to-day life, but making no changes to the narrative um, that are at all ham-fisted or trying to shoe in you know these bigger COVID ideas if anything it's trying to get over it in many ways the other film that did this expertly is non-fiction and that's jackass um jackass forever i think is the full title right but you, uh-huh. you know you're you're watching these guys get you, you, you know beat themselves up and then as the camera turns you see all the other people working on the project that aren't the stunt performers um, and they're all wearing masks um, and they're constrained by COVID. So it's just interesting to kind of see um, how different films have tackled this and incorporated it actually into the film. But Kimmy itself is a, you know, a a anxiety ridden film that if anything uses COVID as a reason why its main character uh, or as a reason partially why its main character begins to suffer from agoraphobia and and a Mm -hmm. fear of going um in public again um she's in this extremely large um apartment i think she's on the fourth floor of her building um 
it's a great studio. Um, for some reason, it seems like there was only one bedroom, but like maybe the largest main room I've ever seen. Um, yeah, I wouldn't even want to leave my house if I had that apartment. I would. That's just exactly what I was thinking. As <laughs> like, the film on. was going, I was like, "Why would you ever want to leave? Look yeah. at this setup." Um, and she works for uh, Amygdala, which is a company that runs a um, uh, feature like the um, the home devices that I cannot say the names of because then mine will start chirping right now. <laughs> um, and that one is called Kimmy, and it's it's just a at home assistant, and she works to try to reconcile issues where a command is given and it is not interpreted correctly by the device or the uh, the super intelligence running it. Um, and that evolves into what turns into a, a heavily influenced by things like the conversation, blowout, mm-hmm. um, even Steven Soderbergh's own unsane uh, thriller. Um, w- what did you make of the the different portions of the film maybe you start at the beginning and we'll work our way through um all right let me rack my brain to remember um i think the beginning does a really when she's when we're just kind of learning who she is and everything and what's going on and we see you know her interactions with the neighbor across the street who comes over to have a little hookup and then we see uh one of the that guy who was across the street who was he in home alone was yes he, he was in, yes okay the guy who wasn't macaulay Culkin in home alone with his yes little the guy who was not kevin in home alone but is kevin yeah and Kimmy. yeah um with his binoculars watching her but i thought like, i mean i know i said earlier it was very precise but there was just a specificity to everything that devin really you... his name is devin ratray he was right. also in mosaic if i remember correctly he was in Side Effects, and which is another Steven Soderbergh film. But then he was in like Nebraska Hustlers, Blue okay. Ruin. He's he's All right. been around. Yeah, yeah. Um, but there was a there was a specificity to everything to how. Uh, oh my God, what was what's the character's name? I wanted to say Kimmy. That's the device. Zoe Kravitz's character. Oh, um, is it Ashley? <laughs> no, it's Angela. Oh um, yeah, it's Angela. Okay. Um, Angela Childs. Yes. Okay. Wow. Thank you. Um, there's such a specificity to the way Angela lives her life. And then I think also the way that the shots were set up to let you know how she lived her life. Like there's one specific motion that she would always do the hand sanitizer and rub her hands together and then fan them just a little bit. Um, Some literal little, hand waving. Yeah. <laughs> um, it was just little things like that that kind of instantly keyed you in, even though it's not um the most verbose film i would say um so then as she overhears a potential murder on the kemi device and then it becomes this like corporate espionage thingy uh thriller uh that was uh, yeah like you said it definitely pulled a lot from the conversation i was watching it i was like I know I've seen a movie with this exact same premise. What is it? And then I was reading reviews and everyone was bringing up the conversation. I was like, oh, there you go. That's it. Um, One of the greatest films of all time, which Kimmy is not. One yeah. Of the greatest <laughs> films of all time. It's a great influence, but um, yeah, watching her twist styles and I mean, the sound composition in the film is very different. The conversation is a very quiet film and, mm-hmm. and that kind of works to make you, like overanalyze every sound you hear yeah whereas kimmy's like buzzing you know you've got the construction overhead she's always typing or clicking or you know clicking open the hand sanitizer you know Mm -hmm. after she's touched nothing but her own keyboard which you know she she's normally putting on the hand sanitizer in situations where she hasn't touched anything which i think is interesting to demonstrate like the state of her mind and the um the amount of control right that's the other mm-hmm. thing about her job is that she's trying to control things. She's yeah. correcting other people's mistakes. Um, or she's she's kind of correcting the mistakes of the of the system for other people. It's it's a weird control thing. And then whenever she's interacting with the only two intimate people she has in her life, her or I guess three, her mom, her therapist, and her neighbor, mm-hmm. all of those, as soon as they try to dictate terms to her, 
yeah no nope. she shuts down and starts mm-hmm. having a, a bit of i wouldn't say a breakdown but um a, a loss so, of control of her emotions yeah. um in communication but whenever she's not dealing with people who have an intimate relationship with her in any way she's in control and she's able to assert herself right like in the office later in the film um with uh chathery i, I can't remember that uh or chowdhury uh the, the last oh thing. yeah exactly. i think it's chowdhury chowdhury um she she asks uh angela what are we doing here and she's like we're waiting for you to call the fbi you know mm-hmm. like she's very in your face about it where she can't be with those intimate with her so it's, it's an interesting development <clears throat> um but as you mentioned the man comes over um at her beck and call sleeps with her and then immediately she kicks him out yeah. and she listens to a the first thing that she turns on um unknowingly is uh the audio of this sexual assault that this woman suffers um and she knew that she was going to be dealing with this or she suspected because she had uh the Kimmy device record um that and many other things whenever she was interacting with this man who turns out to be brad or bradley the uh owner of amygdala um and he's about to do an ipo which is what the film starts on is a a ring light interview with him wearing a suit top half and sleep pants yeah in his garage yeah Uh with the fake background the books all behind him that was funny yes um so yeah uh why don't you go ahead and continue and take us from where we left off um where, where she's breaking down that audio yeah so i mean she figures out or you know is trying to piece together what's going on contacts someone who puts her uh in contact with rita wilson rita wilson's character chowdery um and you know chowdery's like oh yeah you know we at amygdala we really care about this stuff so like come in well, i'll call the fbi the fbi will be on the line we'll get it sorted obviously you know that's not gonna happen but she goes to the office which is the first time that we see her leave the apartment and it's like this uh you know it's very frenetic and like Mm -hmm. she's she hugs the walls the whole time lots of angle shots to Mm -hmm. try to communicate to the viewer how twisted you know she feels or the world appears to be she's always like literally rubbing her shoulder against the wall um it's a lot of you know that that sideline um almost evoking a static shot even though we're constantly moving it's like keeping her center frame and and focusing on her as she travels along a wall um i think there's a scene where she's fleeing later um and there's this overhead drone shot where we've got a great shadow cast of her on the sidewalk and she's she's um weird she weirdly sticks out from that overhead view even though she's just one person in a crowd Mm -hmm. um really interesting shot compositions to communicate like her isolation when she's out in public yeah it was very interesting because it felt it felt very isolated like you were saying and also like just really claustrophobic and uh just really stressful and like she was in like it felt like she was in really tight quarters and like being just closed everything was closing in on her even though she was out in public and she was surrounded by a bunch of people but it felt very alone and very <laughs> scary which the was opposite very of how it felt when she was alone yeah exactly <laughs> so that was super effective um yeah and like there's and then you know she goes to the office she has this conversation with rita wilson and then kind of susses out that things are not what they seem and that amygdala is going to try and silence her instead of uh risking their their stock prices before they go public and yeah and when you say silence what you're really trying to say kill. murder her. yes kill yeah. kill her um, yeah there, there's a hit that they've um, yes. put out <laughs> on her from um the same man who performed the hit on the woman that she has the recording of yeah and uh then it's uh it's it's Jaime Camille and his goons who follow her. Um I don't know. I only know Jaime Camille from Jane the Virgin. I was having a great time. I didn't know any it. of the actors. Well he was he was Rogelio de la Vega in Jane the Virgin. It was like this very egotistical soap opera actor. He was fantastic. I 
no, I didn't. Uh, it was great. He was great in that show. But so to see him as this like hitman guy, I thought it was hilarious. Um, so anyway, so the hitmen come after her, and there's, I don't. To me, I don't. I think some of the sequences involving these hitmen were were cool, but I feel like the I couldn't entirely get behind the concept, maybe, or the execution of the people themselves. I was like, nah. I don't know. I, I think that it was by far the the weakest part of the film. Yeah. Um. The the absolute weakest is I think his name is Yuri. He's the the tech guy that. That's oh, I totally forgot her. about the Romanian one. No, that's Darius. No. Okay. Um. And I... he's he's the one that helps her. He yeah. he asks if she wants oh, to have a drink the... at six a.m. I'm talking about Yuri, the, the one who works for guy. the villains. Got um, it. And he's like, his mom is in the apartment while he's yes. working. Yeah, I yeah, care. There, there's <laughs> no. multiple scenes where he just is um, like tapping his fingers on ASDF uh, <laughs> HJKL. Like he's just like not even pressing, just tapping for like 10 seconds. That's exactly how you hack a computer. I don't know what you're <clears> And there's about. no text return a- a- on any of his nine monitors. Um, and I just couldn't. You know, like there, there are certain things in believability that Steven Soderbergh normally pulls off, and he does in the entire film up to that point. And then um, there's just kind of a break. I don't know if it was the performer or the the direction, but that really um, ruined it. And while the idea of that Matrix, like we're coming for you in the office thing with Angela, when that first happens, it's it's fun and exciting. We have those sideways angles. She's scared. She's running. But eventually, like, we end up at a very fabricated looking protest scene. That, yeah. Where there's just, like, way too much space between them. And there, it's it's a very nonsensical protest for someone that lives in Seattle um, to observe because we have the highest catalytic converter rate theft in the world, as far as mm-hmm. I understand it. And um, the concern very much goes the other way. There's just logistical things as a citizen that... that are questionable number one but number two it, it's just it, it was too sterile looking of a scene yeah. and um while the premise of the van kidnapping is cool if it if it would have had hundreds of people surrounding the van um i i think that would have made more sense if it, if it was a larger downtown um but they were at like a separate like county office on like a side street with a couple dozen people it just didn't work logistically um and that kind of just follows over and over the one scene that did work i think really effectively is when she crosses the the um the crosswalk um hiding behind a group of women yeah. and she gets um spooked by a man who's like pretending to wave it seems like and looking at her and he um is actually waving to a different woman she figures that out as they're hugging and then she's stabbed in the leg by an umbrella and then picked up by um, two villains. And that was really effective, but everything else just kind of doesn't work. It it loses the momentum and the seriousness that the first half had had. Yeah, I agree. Um, Yeah, there there were some, like, I mean, I agree with what you're saying about the protest scene. I think the stuff where she was actually like in the van and was trying to get out and there were people banging on the van when it was just, when the camera was just in the van and you couldn't see outside of it, I thought that was like very effective, very tense when she was trying to escape. And then when she got out, you're like, oh man, this is like, I don't know, 30 people, actors, 30 extras standing together being like, ah. Uh, and they were like three know, waving people in front of the van. Yeah. And this murderer isn't going to run them over with the van. Yeah. Like, yeah. What, yeah. Not very um, logistically believable. But, um, it's it's the tonal control and and the camera work and the way that he's editing these shots together that I think is the reason why Kimmy ends up working. Mm-hmm. Um, earlier in, in we did skip over this. She sets a kombucha bottle half on, yeah. half off the counter. Yeah. Um, as she she tells her um neighbor to leave after she stressed me out so much gotten anyway, so. what she wanted from him and as she's listening to that audio like right as she isolates and she gets out her full-sized mixer and um hears um the man talk at the very end of the recording 
um, the bottle finally falls and shatters. And it's those little things where he kind of, he shows you a thing and then he moves away from it. And it's just natural part of the environment. And it, it works to, to bring the film's tone as a cohesive anxiety thriller together. Um, it's not perfect by any means, but it, it does have a lot of the uniqueness and qualities that um, most the the stuff that we see on VOD, which this did mm-hmm. go straight to, uh, doesn't have these days. Yeah. Yeah. I also, I mean, like I have to say, so at the end of the movie, uh, you know, when the, when the goons have captured her and they also stab the guy from Home Alone, I don't really, I didn't really understand his part and like his role in this movie as in like i don't i can't remember i don't know if this is just me forgetting like i know he tries to stop the people but then they just end up getting her anyway so like was he important i don't know but this regardless regardless (laughs) what i was gonna say yeah yeah well let's address that to begin with right because in the first half of the movie you don't know who he is she's standing at the window and she sees him he has binoculars and he looks at her and she looks away and we constantly as we go through transitions um i so i guess not constantly but um a few times as we go through transitions of interiors to exteriors we will go from angela looking out the window to him looking through his binoculars at something and it's visually signified in the film everything mm-hmm. is dark except for two concentric circles and that that's conveying that there is this rear window aspect that someone yeah. is watching and we don't know why in the narrative and so that heightens the anxiety until you have already seen it and then you know that it's more protective than um you know threatening but he he does um i mean he he attempts to save her he leaves his apartment he hadn't done that from what he says and he left because he saw her leave and he thought that she was Mm -hmm. in trouble she doesn't have her life saved by him um necessarily but the sequence of events that plays out because he's there, I think is different. And and yeah, that might be the true. reason why he's able to, or why she's able to get away with what she gets away with because he, he answers for her a few times and they, they ask, do you have a, a backup of this? And he says, yeah. Yeah. The USB drive, right? Like he answers before she can say no. Um, so there's little things where I, I think he, his character does add something. It's not important but it's useful to the narrative yeah i think i guess i was expecting a bigger reveal or payoff just given how much you know we kept returning to him in the beginning and you were like okay what's what's this guy up to and it was just like nah he just likes to spy on his neighbors because he's lonely or something and then he you know does a couple things i mean it wasn't like distracting it wasn't bad or anything but i was just expecting i think i was just expecting more out of that and I'm not like you know super disappointed that I that it, that didn't turn out to be a huge thing like capital yeah. H huge whatever. Um, I actually kind of like that it wasn't because yeah. normally that's what it would be. And in yeah. this case, he was just an innocuous, nice, lonely guy <laughs> who spies on his neighbor's binoculars. So you know, does she? It's a little creepy. I know they're both creepy. <laughs> They're they're all creepy people. I wouldn't okay. want to <laughs> But uh I will say I you know, okay, when she she goes, she, Angela escapes their clutches by saying to Kimmy, she's like, play uh some beast was it did she was she playing sabotage. the Beastie Boys song? Okay, yeah, it was sabotage. Max I just, I couldn't volume. remember yeah, I couldn't remember if she played it there or if it was a different point, but yeah, she plays it multiple times. But anyway, um and so then she goes she goes through the vents to upstairs where construction is happening gets a nail gun and then shoots a bunch of people which was on the one hand awesome on the other hand i was like what movie is this turning into but i kind of dug it honestly i was like yeah shoot people with a nail gun why not why not i do like it i think it's a little bit um far-fetched oh absolutely not because it doesn't work, but because she didn't ever miss. Yeah. Uh-huh. She didn't miss one shot. And she shot a dude in the neck from a ways away with a mm-hmm. nail gun without aiming. I mean, she, you know, aimed, but there's no target reticle. There's no yeah. sight at all. And she just wings a guy as he's running to a door in the neck 
perfectly. So, um, yeah, I, I mean, it, there is that question of what it is turn into, and it, it is kind of a celebration at the end. Um, but it's, I mean, itself, it's a film about, you know, human greed being the thing that's evil, right? She saves herself by using Kimmy. So Kimmy itself yeah. is not the evil tool. Kimmy is also what documents the crimes that are happening. Mm-hmm. So there's this interesting thing where the tool is neutral and it's the people that are good or bad. And yeah, that's I- what I like about Soderbergh is it's, it's always the thing that is a tool and then the people that are good or bad, whether it's mosaic or um, unsane or, you know, Kimmy. Yeah, I wasn't, uh, I mean, I haven't seen a lot of Soder- Soderbergh films. I've seen Logan Lucky and I've seen Magic Bike. Um, <laughs> so, but I wasn't really, uh, like when she used Kimmy against the, you know, the bad guys and it was, it used it as a force for good. I, I wasn't really expecting that. I was kind of expecting just a blanket, like, statement of, uh, you know, big corporations spying on people is bad. Um, and you know, that is a good blanket statement, but it also, you know, shows that there are nuances to the actual devices themselves. And I thought that added a really interesting layer to the film. Um, and I think that elevated it a lot in my eyes. So I was also kind of, um, intrigued, you know, at the end, it shows that she doesn't have the Kimmy anymore. Obviously the company tried to kill her and then when she revealed everyone and it went under, um, but I think it was interesting to me because I feel like that shot of her table, which is very conspicuously empty of the Kimmy at the end, kind of went a bit more back to being like, ah, these all suck. We should get rid of them. Um, which is not what it was, what the film was trying to convey. Like, Yeah, I don't think ago. that's what it conveys at, at all. I think it conveys that the entire company went under and so did um, the, the devices that they'd already distributed meaning they didn't have their IPO because one corporate they, CEO yeah. ruined this whole thing, which arguably is better than the devices that we have currently. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. You know, mm-hmm. um, so I, I think it was a little bit more neutral, um, but that's an interesting reading. Um, yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to address with it? Um, I would like, absolutely pay to see an action movie of zoe kravitz with a nail gun shooting people I, that's all like i think that would be great <laughs> i uh i i think that we'll get to see her as catwoman here in the next month so yes hopefully that'll uh hold you off for a while um kimmy is now playing on hbo max it did not have a theatrical release and it i believe will be playing there in perpetuity let's get on mm-hmm. to death on the nile Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the newlyweds, Mr. and Mrs. Simon Doyle. You must meet Hercule Poirot. My congratulations, madame. Merci. He's only the greatest detective alive. I suspect you invited me for reasons other than the fun. You had something to hide. We have the Karnak all to ourselves, a chef and enough champagne. To fill the Nile. Should have hidden it, shouldn't you? When you have money, no one is ever really your friend. Death on the Nile, directed by Kenneth Branagh, his follow up to Murder on the Orient Express, which I think was 2018. Um, it stars Gal Gadot, uh, Emma Mackey, Army Hammer, and Kenneth Branagh himself. What did you think of Death on the Nile? I. Uh, I sped read while I listened to it on Audible. I sped listened to Death on the Nile in preparation for this movie. And then it was totally different. And I felt kind of annoyed that I spent all that time. However, the book was great and it was totally worth it. But also I was watching it and I was like, oh, my God, this is really I didn't have to read it. Uh, but just so to clarify, you I should are have. as annoyed as me because I... <laughs> listen to it as well but i listened to it i think back at its very first release like a few months before its original release date oh uh-huh so like uh-huh. a year and a half ago <laughs> wow okay yeah was it so the, the I, david I totally one? Forgot it. um i don't i i think there was only one version i i tried to listen to i think i listened to all the audible um 
Agatha Christie's that they had or Poirot's that they had. Yeah. So I think they, I tried to listen to all the ones from the same narrator, but I don't okay. remember his name because it I was just, over I, a year ago. Well, I just remember it because David Suchet plays, who narrated it on Audible, played Poirot in the BBC stuff for years and years and oh, years. Oh, I didn't yeah. realize that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I was like, aha, this is fun. He was he was a great narrator. Totally recommend the audiobook. Um, yeah. So, I mean, you know, I tend to get very hoity-toity about adaptations, like differing from their source material. Obviously, there are definitely cases where it improves on source material. Like recently, Shadow and Bone on Netflix, I think, is a case. Annihilation, I think, is a case as well. But um, I don't know if that's the case here. I understand differing from the source material because there is a huge cast in Death on the Nile. And I think it could be very unwieldy. I, But I don't know. I was watching it with my friends who hadn't read the book. And um, so I got to lord it over them afterwards. I was like, well, here's what they changed everyone i'm like a super big intellectual uh i i'm so proud of you for being able to remember because i think i've thank you i i've read way too many books to recall what exactly happened since (laughs) no i literally finished it the day before i saw the movie so okay Okay. yeah yeah yeah. (laughs) it's still fresh on the mind yeah Um, but should i should we summarize well i mean why don't you start us off with um the prologue oh yeah okay (laughs) oh man so there's a prologue and it's little poirot de-aged kenneth Branagh, uh sam's mustache although he copies it from his commander it would seem because his captain has a very fine mustachio that then is identical to poirot's later on Mm -hmm. and it's world war one and they're I don't, they're given a mission to charge and beat some Germans, and they're given a time. And Poirot is like, "No, we should go right now because the birds are flying, and that means the east wind is something I can't remember. I don't know." He gives an explanation. I was mm-hmm. a, I was like, "I don't know anything about the wind." Sure. Uh, and then they charge, and it's great. Except then the captain like trips on a tripwire, and the gets blown up and Poirot gets this like scar on his face and that's why he grows his mustache and he also has a lost lady love uh Mm -hmm. who's a nurse who comes to see him and she's like Poirot and he's like no I'm I'm I am this figure don't know you don't look at me and she's like no I still love you and then he's like bah my captain I failed him I've turned into an Italian I'm so sorry that was offensive (laughs) um but yeah (laughs) I uh so the only Agatha Christie book I have read is Death on the Nile, but I enjoyed it immensely and I plan to read some other ones now. But so I but I that definitely wasn't a Death on the Nile. I don't know if Poirot's backstory is explained elsewhere. Um not but, that I recall from the yeah. ones that I've done. I, I think it's an interesting choice to try to build out the Poirot like canon. Um yeah, especially if he continues making these. I don't know that when I watched the film, I thought that there would be many more of them. But from what I understand, it's been doing okay at the box office. So there very well might be more of these. Yeah, it was, um, I don't know, like, it was kind of funny. It was kind of charming. I don't know. I just, I think, I didn't love the film, but I kind of just want Kenneth Branagh to keep making his little Poirot movies. Like, I just, I don't know. I think he he should. They're kind of fun. I think the little ep- the edition of the prologue, I don't know. It's just a little funky, fun little little thing, and it. I think it also. I mean, it set up, you know, more seriously. It did set up a lot of the movie is about love and what we're gonna what we do for love, and um, you know, Poirot spends a lot of time thinking about his lost love. So it's implied that you know he and the nurse either no she died. That's what happened. She he says that she died on the way back from seeing him or something. It was somehow connected. I think it was somehow connected to her seeing him after he got blown up a little bit. Um, Cause he seemed to blame himself for it, but regardless. So, you know, it does set up the themes of love. That's very prevalent throughout the movie. I think it, it also sets up the, the finale scene. I think what was the finale scene with uh, Sophie Okonedo where. Oh he- Yeah. He goes to see her and he's shaved his mustache off, which is something he grew to cover 
his his disfigurement. So it, it's kind of like he's accepting his self and acknowledging that he wants love at some level, um, w- which is an interesting flourish. Mm-hmm. But um, aside from all that um, preamble to to the film, which which does um, introduce us to the romance, there is um, a wedding that's going to take place between Gal Gadot and Army Hammer. And Army Hammer had previously been engaged to her best friend, played by Emma Mackey. And I don't remember any of these characters' names at all. Gal Gadot, well, you're in luck, seeing as I just finished the book a week ago. Gal Gadot is Lynette Ridgway uh, Doyle, once she marries Simon Doyle. And then her best friend is Jacqueline de, Belf- de Belfort. And that's Emma Mackey's character. Okay. Um, yeah. And then they there are a bunch of other people. And that's too. our love triangle that builds into a love pentagram, which builds into a love hexagram. I don't know. It goes very far and wide. <laughs> um, but Poirot is seemingly um, on vacation when he's really investigating um, whether or not uh, his protege from the previous film should be allowed to marry uh, Letitia Wright's character. And um, that, I think, should have been played very differently in the film because it would have added um, more intrigue to the early portions where we're just kind of looking at gauzy, overglossed images that are kind of vapid of meaning. Um, But yeah, I guess, what did you think of that introductory sequence where he's asking for all those, uh, what what were they, truffles or cookies, and he's watching... um, gal and army and emma dance um like i i was sitting next to my friends and we were just i don't know we were giggling a lot because i don't think we expected the movie to be as sexy as it was but like those dance moves were steamy like army hammer was all up in their crotches all the time yeah it was Uh, full-on air coitus (laughs) yeah yeah um and I was like sitting next to a family and I was like, oh my God, um, this is not, it was not as, as kid friendly, I think, as they were expecting maybe. But um, I thought that scene was like the the dancing between Army Hammer, uh, cannibalism accusations aside, and Emma Mackey was just like electric. I was, I, Emma Mackey, especially, I think she just has like a ton of charisma. Yes. And it was super watchable, gorgeous. Um also good at also talking attractive. words yes which it's gal just, yes. was not <laughs> yeah yeah you know mm-hmm. uh-huh. that, that but, was an uh, extremely painful part of the film is uh she she would deliver those lines um i gosh i just read in someone's review earlier this week that it sounded like she was uh commentating an advertisement at every line delivery and I, I was like, that's exactly <laughs> what it is. It's, it's like this flat delivery to the camera, not to like her counterpart. Like the the yeah. the same amount of charisma that there is between Emma Mackey and literally anyone she's interacting with is the opposite of of uh, Gal in in the film, which is really interesting because things like Wonder Woman, right? The whole film loves her and mm-hmm. like she's just incredibly charismatic. But here, mm-hmm. um through kenneth's direction that just doesn't work yeah and it's um you know gal obviously is a very attractive woman like you know no let's not beat around bush here she's gorgeous but with but in this film she was kind of like a charisma vacuum and so compared to emma mackie so the scene with so army hammer and emma mackie have their dance and it is very sexy it's very appealing um and it's like, whoa, these these guys, like they they have fun. Um, mm-hmm. And then they uh, they go, and Emma Mackey introduces Army Hammer to Gal Gadot, and they have a little eye moment, and then they go dancing, and then he is again all up in her business as well. Um, and even though you know Lynette Gal's character is supposed to be just like gorgeous, gets everything she wants. Um, because she's very rich also and like you know has never had anyone really say no to her because she's beautiful and charming and has a bunch of money um but i it just didn't like the casting didn't work here because they were dancing and i was like literally just go back to emma Mackey. like y'all have so much more chemistry uh 
this is just, you know, it's two really attractive people dancing, but it's not doing anything for me. And it doesn't. And then when Simon and Lynette go on to get married, you're like, I don't buy it because Simon and, and Jackie, Jacqueline, were clearly having a lot more fun. Even if the film didn't mean to portray it that way, even though the film was like, ah, no, look at Simon and Lynette. They're like, you know, they're going to be the thing. They weren't. I I do kind of wonder if that's something that Kenneth wanted to pull off. Yeah. This idea that um, this feeling that you're seeing something happening that's false and you don't really know the full extent of why, right? That's That's kind of why Agatha Christie's novels are great is because you know that she's presenting you this at, at this weird perspective because she wants you to f- freeze up on it. And she's counting on you getting the wrong reading, which is going to make the ending so much better. Right. And I think that Kenneth had the same idea in mind, but at some level, Gal just ends up being a cardboard cutout. Mm-hmm. And um, I, I mean, you seem to be very infatuated with the dancing aspects, but to me, it's the, in the same um, sequences, it's the dialogue that I think really signifies um, my issues with the film, which is when, when Emma and army are are talking, there's this um, like locked gaze they have and this total one-to-one interaction in front of the camera that is not there when it's army and gal there's a superfluousness mm. to to her performance where it, it seems like she is putting on airs and, and acting to act away rather than trying to actually engage with army. Um, and that continues yeah. as they get on the boat, um, as they, they have their interactions while Emma Mackey is quote unquote stalking them um, al- along the shores of the Nile. Um, yeah. Just to clarify, I'm only infatuated when Emma Mackey was dancing with Army Hammer. When Gal oh, okay. was doing it, I was like, no, that's what I was trying to say. Like, you know, Lynette, regardless of whether Brennan meant to kind of stage this or frame this as uh, ringing false when Simon and Lynette get together, Lynette is still supposed to be this very charming, charismatic girl who just draws everyone in around her. Um, and you know it's it's hard to portray that when the girl who's supposed to be lesser than like the second place girl you know in the in the book they're compared a lot to the sun and the moon with like Lynette being the sun and then Jackie being the moon like always overlooked Mm -hmm. and it's really hard to feel that comparison in the movie because Emma Mackey just completely outdoes Gal in every single respect um, yeah, it's it's like a problem of getting too good of a performer, mm-hmm. almost. Yeah, exactly. That's that's literally <laughs> it. Yeah, like it's, it's kind of gotten... like uh, Russell Brand being in this movie. Like <laughs> yeah. he ends up out acting every other side character at such mm-hmm. a high level that you're like, well, I love you, Annette Benning, but Russell Brand is doing something we yeah. didn't know he could do. I know Annette Benning. I was like, I she didn't have much of a character, but also I was like, this is not good. <laughs> Uh, so there's only so much she could do but yeah i was shocked by russell brand i was like okay okay an incredible uh character work by him but let's let's jump to the yeah. actual um pyramid scene um to start with poirot uh shouting at his his friend without knowing it for flying a kite on the pyramid and ruining his yeah. his gaze at the uh the what would that be the horizon with the pyramid decorating it yeah. um what did you think of that whole introduction to get us onto the boat to begin with um so i didn't i haven't seen her on the orient express um so i didn't know i mean i i had known that there was a character in it who was going to be back and i had, like assumed that it was uh luke tom mm-hmm. bateman's character um He's dating Daisy Ridley. No one cares about that, but it was really exciting to see. Um, anyway, so, you know, and even even not knowing who, that he was in Murder on the Orient Express and clearly was helping Poirot out with that, I was like, okay, obviously these are buddies. So I kind of inferred that, you know, they knew each other. Um, the whole, I 
don't want to like harp on about book changes <laughs> but um because i know it's like not the point of this um but so in the movie it's everyone is brought together by the wedding party to get on the boat and they get on the boat as a way army hammer dev- quote unquote devises that as a way to get away from emma mackie who's stalking him and mm-hmm. gal Gadot. um so in the movie it's everyone is brought together by the wedding party including poirot because book is like join the wedding party friend because i'm here for the wedding and you're my friend so come here for the wedding also um and so Paro also, like, also gets swept up into it. And then they all go on the boat. Um, and whereas in the book, it's just random. You know, every like it just happens that there are all these people on the boat and not all of them are connected to Lynette. Some of them are just there. Some of them are there for Lynette, but pretend to be just happenstance there. Um, I felt the movie, it was very contrived the way that... Mm-hmm. They had everyone on the boat and everyone knew Lynette and was connected. Um, and basically every character in the movie was an amalgamation of at least two characters from the book. Um, like Book is not a character in the book, but he is basically, uh, oh my God, I'm forgetting his name. I literally just read this a week ago. Tom, whatever. His name is Tom. Yes. And his mom, he's a right. big mommy's boy. Yes. Um, oh my Tom. God, I'm Googling yeah. this. And he, Tom Hold is on. in a lot of the books, if I remember correctly. Is he? Um, okay. I, I think so. I think that he's he's one of the primary characters that I ran across in like four or five of them. I think I, I read like a dozen um, of the Agatha Christie's last year. Um, and, and there was constantly that side character or a side character. Tim that... Tim Allerton. There we okay. go. Um, <clears throat> one one of my but... primary issues, I think most people probably care that, that read the Agatha Christie books at all. Um, all right. is that the the entire staff is totally divorced from everything that happens. Yeah. So everything is relegated to only and exclusively guests on board. And yes. every yeah. shipmate, um, the the captains, the the chefs, the wait staff, they have nothing to do with the film at all, which is very un Agatha Christie ish like you we should at least waste time thinking it's them for 10 minutes you know like they they should add a layer of um subtlety to the film but instead they're they're just there to make the the boat kind of exist and have all these contrived characters interplay with each other um in a way that that isn't convincing at all much like the cgi outside of the boat is (laughs) very unconvincing and yeah. one of the worst qualities of the film. Yeah, unfortunate. Yeah, it felt, I don't know, I, I think it was just a lot more effective when there was a wider net like in the book, whereas this, it was, I don't know, all of it just felt very, like I said, contrived. Like, oh yeah, well, this person is also here for the wedding and they, you know, have a motive this way. And it just, it felt far more like, I don't know what I'm trying to say. Um, I, I don't want to say like amateur, but just the way, like the fact that it was a murder mystery and everyone knew each other and Super it was all prime. Maybe? Yeah, I don't, I don't know. I just didn't feel. Because um, it's, it's just, definitely decadent enough to not be amateur, but like it's made up of so much like bullshit that it's, yeah, it's would, hard to take the movie that seriously less, as you're watching it. Yeah, I mean, it's more like like just the premise I just felt too neat to have neat and like wrapped up in a bow to have everyone be as a part of the wedding party and everyone get on the boat. Whereas again, in the book, it's like far more natural. Like all these people are coming together and it's less like, oh my God, we're going to have a murder mystery. So we need to have everyone together and everyone related to the person who's going to get killed versus a, oh yeah, we're going to have a murder mystery, but first we're going to build up all of these different people with different motivations that aren't just connected by the one person. I don't know. Um, yeah, but it, it wasn't like amateur in terms of a lot of like the way it's made for most mm-hmm. part, except for the CGI, like you said. Um, yeah. But I feel like the setup, the way that the movie set it, the everything up, robbed it of some of the effectiveness and intrigue. Yeah, it, it makes the payoffs not ring as um, strongly as Murder on the Orient Express did. Um, I know you haven't seen it, but 
one of the interesting things that Kenneth did in that film with the sets is that everything was open topped. <clears throat> so he could have his camera go over a wall and into a room and, and then back up and over another wall and into another room. So you could mm -hmm. see characters in the rooms being themselves all in one take, um, which created some really interesting dynamics to, to the filmmaking. Mm -hmm. But here, number one, we, we don't have that open top room. Two, we're always constrained by the doorways that he's mm -hmm. going through. And while the exterior shots of, of the boat are interesting, they're kind of reminiscent of classical Hollywood in a lot of ways that, that is pleasing. In the end, none of the cinematography choices really feel um, nuanced inspired. in a way. Mm -hmm. Well, I think they're inspired or at least they're homaging, you know, bigger films like The African Queen or, or things like that. Um, there's particularly an overhead shot where um, I think it's Army and someone else are on the stairwell and, and um, Poirot is looking down at them accusatorily and like um, yelling at them. So there's there are a couple like interior shots in that larger room with the stairwell that are interesting. But otherwise, um, the, the direction that was, to me, interesting and intriguing that Brana had shown us in Murder on the Orient Express and just in Belfast is mm -hmm. very absent here right that opening have you seen belfast yeah that opening scene of belfast is one of the most interesting pieces of cinematography mm -hmm. that um hit cinema screens last year and we don't get anything close to that yeah. in, in this film there was um i was skipping ahead of that in the plot but after lynette spoilers is killed uh she's the death on the nile or one of the deaths on the nile one of the many <laughs> yeah um there is no 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 it's actually no it's before that it's when simon army hammer is quote unquote shot in the leg um and the doctor russell brand is taking him to a room and it's this like long tracking shot of them yes. like coming from the room out and then going into uh like going along the hallway and then going into russell brand's room and like jacqueline is also there and she's losing her mind and everything um yeah, we pass past where she's yeah. getting injected, right? Yeah, I thought I really liked that, and I think that felt, I did too. Um, it also telegraphed the importance of that moment. Though. Yes, yeah, for sure. But like that, I thought was really interesting. It, it kind of, I don't know, it kind of looked a bit like a like a play set, like a theater set. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I don't know. I'm thinking about like noise, the noises offset, which has like two stories. That's really specific, but whatever. So, but it had, you know just things were going on and it wasn't necessarily always in the foreground, but there was always something going on. It was just like very fluid and you knew that everything was happening all at once. Um, and I thought that was like, that was one, maybe the only moment, one of the only moments where I was like, that looks really cool. Yeah. That that's, that's cool. <laughs> that feels like classic Hollywood where there's this yeah. big old in like fake stage. And there's all these people that are doing their specific things while, the camera follows these people do the specific thing. That's that's where classical Hollywood is fun. And I, I think mm -hmm. that's where Braun is at his best is when he's trying to do this um, cinematic interpretation of what you would see in a play. That's, I think, where he's yeah. always been at his best. And I think that's what he got away from here, especially with those CGI exteriors <laughs> where you lose your stakes in, entirely. And, um, you know, I, I question whether or not having the same thing but with those decadent painted backgrounds that we used to see in the 50s and the 40s would have been better like just go full classic hollywood and show mm -hmm. us a painted background um but y you mentioned um kind of the the ending and the comeuppance i don't think we need to get into the entire logistics but but what did you think of that uh that finale sequence um I, uh, the thing is i don't think the movie spent enough time building up the other suspects and actually making things believable. Like, you know, the, the twist wasn't really a twist. And that's not just because I had read the book beforehand. I think it was because none of the other suspects seemed like they actually would have anything. They would actually kill anyone. Like there was no, um, 
you know, like I was talking to my friends afterwards who had not read it, but they were like, yeah, there was, they basically thought it was spoilers, Simon and Jacqueline the whole time. And they yeah. were right. Um, whereas again, in the book, I feel so annoying saying that in the book, I feel like there's a very plausible, like there was definitely for the most of it. I was convinced that Jacqueline and Simon couldn't have done it. Cause I was like, well, Simon was shot in the leg and Jacqueline was knocked out on morphine. So obviously they couldn't have done it. And it wasn't until like closer to the end. And I was like, Oh, uh, um, and there was not really that, uh, deniability in the movie. I felt it was basically just, a race to see how fast it's going to take them to figure out that Simon and Jacqueline did it versus an actual mystery to be like, Oh my God, we have to methodically go through everyone and see who could have done this. Um, so I felt the ending fell flat um, in most ways. Emma Mackey was great though. Loved her. Yeah. I, I would agree with just about everything you said. I, I do think that there was a question of, how many other people were involved um mm-hmm. but i mean th- there was no doubt that army um was responsible and if he was responsible then due to the the scene that you mentioned at the very beginning of the film where where they're dancing magnetically it's like you know that they're in cahoots together yeah um and then it's just a question of well do they need the lawyer do they need the doctor like who else did they need to pull this thing off type of a mm-hmm. thing um I I think that he is able to, even though it was pulled off poorly in, in this case, I think he's able to bring your attention to the focal point um, in a way that other directors wouldn't um, at, with that end scene. He's able to kind of um, take all these different moving character threads and try to make you invested in watching the way it's going to play out, even though you already know who is uh, the perpetrator, you don't know what that interaction is going to uh, lead to. If more people are going to die, that type Mm -hmm. of thing. So I do think that it's interesting how he pulls that off, but um, I I can't say that this inspired me to think that he really needs to make another one and that that would necessarily be a good idea. If he did, I, I would prefer he goes to the countryside. I can't remember the name of it, but there's one where they're just in the countryside and um, it's very small, a couple houses, and they're just trying to solve a murder that happened before he arrived. Um, mm. And I, I think that that low stakes, no mm. need for CGI, just normal detective type story you know your your classic batman detective story yeah. is exactly what he needs to do um because in belfast he showed us how cinematic he can make everyday life look and i yeah. i i would really like to see him go that direction because it's probably honestly a lot cheaper because you don't mm-hmm. need this kind of uh extremely large star-studded cast to do so um but that's my two cents is there yeah. anything else you wanted to go over um no i think you know i I, like to i know i've been like ragging on about well actually in the books but like just to clarify there are there are a ton of people in the in the in death on the nile the book and like there's it would be very very hard to make a two-hour movie and give all those people the screen time room Yeah. yeah um so like i totally understand combining people um like that's fine i just uh i don't know i don't think the combinations always worked really well and i think they're still i think it was maybe whittled down a little bit too much and made a little bit too everyone knew each other all the time but you know what i don't like at the end of the day i still i still enjoyed it you know it was a fine way to spend a Sunday afternoon or whenever I saw it. It was a Sunday. That doesn't matter. But uh, like perfectly enjoyable. And I, you know, I like that Kenneth Branagh is getting the money to make adaptations of, of like classic Agatha Christie novels. And it's not like some, I mean, obviously Agatha Christie is it, huge, but it's not like a big marvel star wars disney ip and he's just like doing his thing he's adding these little kind of self-indulgent 
prologues about how Praro got his mustache. I don't know. I just, you know, even if I didn't love it, I'm kind of like, yeah, I should just do whatever you want, Kenny. I, I also didn't love it, but I do like that this type of thing is getting made contemporarily yes. yeah. in a world where 95% or whatever of gross earnings are from franchises. Yeah, oh, you know, exactly. You throw this franchise in the mix um, be, because it's um, more original than mm-hmm. many of the other ones. Yeah. but um, I'm that saying w- that as someone who like, you know, worships at the feet of the mouse. That's a joke. Also, I, I think I have a healthy dose of self-awareness about that. But. Yeah, you just keep <laughs> repeating the joke and maybe one day you'll believe it's a joke. I know. I know. <laughs> one day. All right. Without further ado, let's get on to Reed Carolyn and Channing Tatum's dog. I need to get back in the game, sir. You want to get back in the game? Prove it. Sergeant Rodriguez was a legend. Family funeral Sunday outside of Nogales. They want his dog at the funeral. You do this and you're back in the game. She won't work with anyone. One minute she's good, the next minute she's sending three guys to the ER. What's up, dog? And you're gonna go on a little road trip. Easy. What are y'all so scared of? Come out without big time. <laughs> what is your deal, man? Maybe just take the crazy down one notch. Hey! No, 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 no! No! You're just a demon. You're just a demon! What did you think of the directorial debut of both Channing Tatum and Reed Carolyn as co-directors? You know, dog was exactly what it says on the tin. And that's fine. It was a movie about a dude and his dog. And it was pretty solid. Like, I don't, you know, I wasn't going in expecting something very great or profound. But I I think it had some depth in there. And it was a nice little, little Thursday afternoon for me. Thursday evening. Had a good time. Totally. Well, I was going to say inoffensive, but there's some weird things in Portland that happened. So I was like, maybe not. (laughs) (laughs) Other than that, I guess it was mostly inoffensive. Uh, Like solid. I don't really know. There's I I don't have a whole lot to say because I don't feel like there is a whole lot to say other than it, it was a movie and it was fine. I enjoyed it. It was a movie. I think it was more than fine. And I did enjoy it. Um, Channing Tatum probably has more projects with Steven Soderbergh than any other director that I'm aware of. Um, Steven Soderbergh has ties to Thomas Newman, who did the composition for the film. Um, Mm -hmm. Additionally, Newton Thomas Siegel did the cinematography. And if you looked at the trailers for Dog, you just go, okay, Marley and me or whatever. Like, But from a, a military guy's perspective... But the the cinematography and especially the lighting is like actually always nearly perfect. And there's no actively bad looking scene, which is normally mm-hmm. something that you would see out of a directorial debut. And you would especially see out of this weird mid budget type of a road movie. Like there would just be scenes that don't look aesthetically pleasing. Um, even, you know, universally celebrated things like the hangover have, actively ugly looking scenes in them. Dog never has anything like that. And I think it's primarily because of of Siegel's direction. He did um the cinematography for Drive, The Usual Suspects, mm-hmm. which they repeat the lineup scene in yeah, um, yeah. in Dog and Three Kings. So so he has quite a storied career. I think they used um anamorphic lenses uh for the entirety of the shoot. So it's weirdly good looking. It's also really cohesive uh, as like a character study, which is not normally what you get out of the dog movies. Normally you're getting yeah. um, like a romance, sadness, sort of a, a like co- coagulation, commingling mm-hmm. of, of themes and ideas. But here it's really just um, a character study where the dog actually kind of plays a a secondary role to Channing Tatum's character, um, Briggs, who is trying to get his career back in the military after suffering an injury. And um, he has to take medication because he's susceptible for seizures and night terrors and all sorts of stuff. Um, Yeah. Is is there anything you want to build on off that? I mean, I will say, so Channing Tatum, something that I was thinking about, I mean, Channing Tatum, a lot of his career was built off his looks and like his, his like exclusively. Abs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> his abs specifically. 
Um, but I mean, other you know, he is very charismatic. It's not I, you know, I don't think he's he's not just a a good looking dude with a six pack. Like I think he's he's very funny. Um, Twenty Two Jump Street is a cinematic masterpiece. I'm like not even joking. This is a cinematic masterpiece. Um, anyway, but it's uh, no Logan Lucky, but I do like it. Logan Lucky also great. Um, fantastic. But what I was going to say is I admire, you know, in this movie that he directed, he's not afraid to let himself look really ugly. Like there are multiple scenes where he's like drooling basically. Mm-hmm. And yeah. like, he's beaten up and he looks terrible. Um, so I, I just, mean, he I, has the seizure in the bathroom, right? Yes. Yeah. And it's like, horrific. And that's, that's an actual convincing portrayal as well. I mean, he doesn't have quite the frequency of muscle spasms that, you know, would, would, behoove like a full-on seizure but he does Mm -hmm. contort his mouth and like flex um his his throat in a way that is very very convincing yeah it was it was like hard that was very hard to watch um but it's something that you know i admire that in his first time directing he's like yes let me make myself look bad uh and i you know that's a that's a good thing you know he's just um i think that's a definitely paints him in a good light um, and I appreciated that. So yeah, he's self-effacing. Um, mm-hmm. Building on his physicality, which, I mean, this performance is very much built on what his body is willing to do. There's a scene near the end of the film where it, the car's broken down, or the Bronco's broken down, and they have to mm-hmm. walk, and it's raining and thundering. And he had stood out in the rain, and he goes inside, and he's actively shivering. Yes, and just the fact that he actually is shivering instead of pretending to shiver, mm-hmm. it, it just, it really cements the actual idea of them being in this place and doing this thing. Because at some level, you know that this is all a movie. It's it's mm-hmm. definitely not believable. It's a road comedy or a road dramedy in many ways. But there's those little things that you mentioned, like the actual seizure or him actually shivering, where it, it actually it actively becomes real, even though we all are processing that it's a movie. Um, it, it has actual stakes baked into the physicality of the character. Mm-hmm. There's also that scene, in, um, I guess not in Portland, but outside of Portland where uh, Lulu jumps out of the Bronco and goes mm-hmm. and barges into the weed farm Yeah, with, with Jane Adams. And there we, you know, we watch Channing, get his ass kicked and then get ready to murder someone with an ax. And mm-hmm. so there's these weird, um, you know, back and forths with, with the tone. But yeah. I, I think then, that the film stays on track the whole time. Like you always are. I never was watching the movie and wanted to like, had the time to think of something else. Like I just always wanted mm-hmm. to watch what was actively happening, which shows great control. Mm-hmm. Um. See, that's funny because I like the whole thing where he, the Lulu, the dog runs away and then gets into the weed farm. And then Channing's like, tr- ho- got, got to, gets a horse trank in him and mm-hmm. then dozes off. And that's the first time you see him drool uh, profusely on screen and dog. Um, and uh, see, I was thinking, I was like, this, I don't know. That was a little, it was a little too weird for me. But, I wasn't, it wasn't weird enough where I was completely taken out of the movie. I was just kind of sitting there and I was like, what, what's, what's going on? Like, what? A, yeah, what th- is this, this is absurd. This yeah. would never happen in real life. And then it's like, well, if this did happen in real life, no one would believe you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, but I think I liked the aftermath of that. More, with Jane like Adams's you, character, yeah, and like, well, really, she wants I'm a big about, mattress and Indian <laughs> food. <laughs> yeah, but really, really thinking about the the scene where he's in Channing Tatum's, like in the the dress, the the robe, like the pink floral robe, and has like a weed edible. And it's like he's, I don't know. I just thought that that image was just very funny to me. Um, and, and again, that's like you said, it's the the change of tone, um, from like him being zip tied to a chair to him. 10 minutes later in a pink flowy robe eating a weed gummy with the guy who just uh locked him up face or you know time to a chair and like 
jokingly being like, oh, yeah, I have I have all these brain injuries and my friend like probably, you know, my friend killed himself, but it's no big deal. I'm fine. Um, I liked that part. The things leading up to that, I was like, I don't know about this. But again, it wasn't it wasn't. I also think that the movie, I wasn't really taking the movie entirely seriously, not in a bad way, but just in like a. Um, it's not a movie that behooves being taken too seriously. Right. So, like, I didn't really mind that it was so weird like that. Um, it wasn't, it, it was out of place, but it, I wasn't just like, oh my God, this movie, like, is trying to be high art and it's doing this weird thing. Like, no, it's, I don't, it, like, who cares? I don't know. It's just, it's, it's trying okay. to be a, a silly, serious character study and yeah. also, like, an appreciation of the dog specifically, Mm -hmm. but, but also a way of, I think, communicating the trauma that comes home and the inability to confront that trauma and the denial that, that so many service members come home and Mm -hmm. put themselves in. And there's that line, right. Where, um, uh, gosh, the, I think it's the guy from my name is Earl and I'm forgetting his name. He's a great performer. Um, says, you know, you put the whole country on your back, but then you come home and you can't even talk to your friends about what you feel. And yeah. it's just like, there's little bits of very sincere reflection of the, the lives of service members that make the film really um, earnest. And I mm-hmm. think that that's why it, it has so much goodwill from me, at least. Um, it's also a film, um, from what I understand, that is based in its inception on uh, a documentary that Channing Tatum Mm. produced back in 2017 called War Dog, Uh A Soldier's Best Friend. And um, it's through that interaction with with them that he'd come up with this idea for a dog movie, which is how Dog got its name, is as they were writing it, they were just like the dog movie. Let's, you know, and they influenced it off of um, the events of that documentary and those relationships. So I think that a fair amount of it is kind of, um, especially what's in the binder is influenced by real things, um, which I, I think translates to the film and is what makes it so per- personal. It's a weirdly mm-hmm. personal feeling movie. Oh, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, I I really liked, um, <clears throat> who knows, definitely very empathetic towards the service members, um, the veterans portrayed in the movie and like i mean i think it did a very good job of doing it you know the character study of briggs and it's not like i don't know it wasn't there was no like you know tying it everything in a little bow and being like he's cured the dog fixed him and he fixed the dog and they're better together like obviously you know obviously there's a bit of like you know there's a bit of that going on in there because it's a dog movie. Great. But yeah, it's but not- it's really just like they're broken, but right. if they're together, they probably won't commit suicide or right. be put down. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I really, and you know, like I said, the the bit where he's like flipping through the book with that guy and is, you know, in complete denial about his own issues and his friend's issues and what they've gone through and what the dog has gone through. I think also there's that one, there's one moment where in the they're in the hotel and he puts on the TV the footage from Lulu's Lulu's uh, like greatest vest. hits. Yeah, where she's just like killing people and I was like holy shit, that's horrific. Um but I think that was a really good moment because you know, he both he and the dog were just so flippant about that. It's just cuz like that kind of violence was just normal to them. Um and I was you know that that, uh, that contrast there, I thought was very effective because I was watching it in the theater and I was like, "Oh my god, like <laughs> that's that's messed up, that's fucked up." Um, yeah, so I really like that that moment. I think it handled things like that very well. Yeah, it, it shows the. I I mean, you know, there's that line where the dog doesn't know it's at work, mm-hmm. and I think that's yeah. also um mm-hmm. from the same guy who was in My Name Is Earl that I mentioned earlier. Um, So you have to like teach them that work can be fun Mm -hmm. um, so that they don't associate it with the, the traumatic event that they had. And um, Ethan Supley, that's the guy. That's his name. He's a fantastic actor and he's only gotten better. Um, 
at, as he's aged. Um, I, I think that most the the road trip before California is where the comedy really um, had has its best aspects. There's the hotel scenes and that usual suspects lineup mm-hmm. that occurs um, at, for a while in California, but kind of everything else ends up being about the character development and maturation, especially the the final scenes as he comes back down to California to live. Mm-hmm. Um, w- what do you think about how they delineated up those, those moments of dramatic tension versus comedic tension? Um, hold on. I'll get back to that. But I want to circle back to like the thing, like at the hotel. So the reason that he goes into the usual suspects lineup is because Lulu sees a Muslim man in like a, a mm-hmm. turban and attacks him because that's what she's been trained to do. Mm-hmm. And that was also a moment where I was sitting in the theater. And I was like, oh my God, that's that's like horrible. That um you know, and I think and the I look, the film is not trying to have like big social commentary, really. I mean, it has like it, it does it definitely has social commentary. Um, but that was definitely something where I almost wanted them to pull on that thread a little more because it basically ends with with the guy who had been attacked being like, yeah, I'm not going to press charges. You need to get professional help, though. And Channing Tatum's like, yeah, bah, yeah, totally. Um, so, you know, that this is a film. I don't know if it's equipped to deal with all of this social commentary that's going on there. And it, I don't think it wants to try to do that. But I would have been intrigued for them to pull on that thread a little more. Um, cause that was another instance where I was just like, oh my God, like that, that's, you know, terrible. And I, there's a lot to be said there. Um, and you know, it is literally just the dog doing its job. Like, and there, I, there was just a bunch of layers there that I was like, that's really interesting. I would like to dig into that more. And the movie doesn't, which is not necessarily a flaw because like I said, it's not like, it's not trying to be a huge social commentary piece and i don't think it would be good if it tried to do that but it's just something there that i don't know i don't really know i don't know yeah i I think that its strength is that it shows it and it knows the importance of showing it and it doesn't over uh enunciate it doesn't try to make um factual or moral claims it -hmm. shows what it is it lets channing tatum literally say out loud that it's fucked up that it's bad but the actual reasons that it happened and that those are in no way the responsibility of either the dog that did it or, or him. And so it, it presents all the, the stuff that is hard to contend with clearly delineated, but it it also very clearly represents the, like, you know, you should think about this, but like in this genre of film and in this film, there's nothing more for us to say other than to yeah. show you the potential real world, you know, happenings of of what this looks like when it comes home and mm-hmm. it's done serving and it's done doing its job. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah. I mean, I yeah. I mean, like I said, I feel like if like if they had actually tried to capital C comments on it, I feel like I would have been like that. Nah, stop. Bad. <laughs> um, yeah. But I do. I do wonder if maybe there could have been a little bit more there, but not in like a, and still in more of a show don't tell way. But you know, whatever. That's, I mean, it's but a I, road I like movie. They the have, ultimate yeah, yeah. point is to continue no, moving. Absolutely, but like, but I still appreciate that they have that scene, and I thought that was a very another scene that I was like, damn, wow. Uh, yeah. Could have been a little bit more, in my opinion, but whatever. I'm not like complaining that much about it. So I'm glad it is in there at all. So yeah, that's something. Yeah. Um, but back to the, the initial question, what did right. you think about the dramatic and the comedic stops along the way and, and how that's attempting to, you know, build up to this final scene, which, or it's not the final scene, but to the, the funeral service, which was more than a little heartbreaking. Yeah. I, yeah. Um, so I feel like I, most of the movie was like a like a chuckle funny like a you breathe out of your nose a little heavier than normal funny mm-hmm. not like a hearty guffaw like ha 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 funny um so i 
think. Well, when you figured out it was a pot farm, that made me like actually giggle a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, and then like some moments, like I think some of the comedic moments where he's in a bar in Portland, like that didn't really land for me. Um, I was like, okay, whatever. Um, so I don't know. I don't think the comedy was so strong that it made the dramatic. It, it was a huge contrast with the dramatic moments. Um, and I think, and I think that's good because it allowed the dramatic moments to land pretty well. I think like, like you're saying, the funeral scene is very sad. I mean, especially, you know, there's a moment where there are other, um, you know, veterans or no current service members who are shooting off blanks, but they're still shooting their guns in respect to the, the guy, the, uh, lieutenant. The, whatever sergeant i don't know i, I guy, don't remember uh what rodriguez, his title was the guy yeah, whose dog lulu mm-hmm. was and like channing tatum has like lulu goes and lays down at the guy's shoes because they mm-hmm. smell like her owner and then but then channing tatum has to go and like make sure that when the guns go off she doesn't lose her marbles because she also has ptsd um that was that was like a very effective subtle moment that i thought i was like oh wow that's impressive. Um, yeah. And yeah, the another... whole film kind of builds towards it and it is yeah. pulled off without any um, over exemplifying yeah. anything. They're, they're not trying to force anything. It just yeah. happens. And it's like that happened. I felt it. It did not feel good, but it nope. felt <laughs> real. And um, I, I, I'm just very surprised at the tonal control exhibited by mm-hmm. these two direct. Mm-hmm. Uh, first time directors to make all this stuff kind of sing together even though as we talk about these little moments like maybe they each have their little flaws but as a cohesive piece it just works and I think uh, you know it is another that scene is another example of how much they did they showed things and they didn't just tell you Mm -hmm. didactically things um, which I thought was great um I feel like the closest, the, I feel like the closest thing they got to it was when he was at the bar in Portland. They were like having all these people being like super stereotyped Portland people and being like, Oh my God, you're in the military. Do you realize the cause, the harm? Like, do you like being a part of a multi billion dollar infrastructure thing that's ruined? Uh, that part, it was like, I felt like it was more like telling people like Portland people are kind of crazy. I don't know. Uh, whereas, but then there well, was a lot of subtlety shown. Okay. There as is someone, branding. Yeah. I don't know. Portland I'm from, is known as weird. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. I've never been to Portland. So, you know, maybe people are like that. But I don't know. Um, but so I feel like I think so those less subtle moments seem worse because there are such really good subtle moments as when Channing Tatum at the funeral goes to make sure Lulu doesn't lose her mind at the gunshots going off. Um, but most of those moments are contained at the beginning, like you said, where it's the more overtly comedic half. So mm-hmm. then once it shifts and focuses and you don't have those kind of moments, it's really, and it really just starts to focus on the more subtle things and it's not trying to really provoke a huge laugh. Um, then I think it's more effective. Um, and I think, yeah, I, I wish at the beginning it had maybe shown a little bit more of that subtlety, but I don't know. That's just me. I don't really, I wasn't, you know, super offended. I don't know. Maybe if I, think, I was from Portland, I'd be offended. But <laughs> I'm not. I'm from Atlanta. Who cares? There, there is one scene um, in California, which I think dances between this trauma that needs to be addressed and comedy. And that's when he puts on the the suit to, oh, have, yeah. to have Lulu attack him yeah. and she won't. But then um, his buddy's dog does attack him, yeah. and, it, and it it gets at this thing of the the unresolved trauma that both of them have and the frustration that he mm-hmm. has. But it also gives us a laugh at the same time. And there's yeah. there's those little things like that that I think really show that there's there's more to these two than um, than just the the classic shtick of a a road movie like there's Mm -hmm. they're communicating something deeper and it's really um interesting to see uh, an unassuming movie called dog do something like that you know (laughs) yeah we got dog we got pig we got lamb what's next Uh, i think we need a horse i think we should do horse i i I have believe you (laughs) 
<laughs> I have some some horses I could audition. Okay. So hit me up. If anyone's writing that, hit me up. <laughs> was there anything else you wanted to go over with dog? Um, not really. I mean, it was, you know, I liked it. I was, I, I didn't love it, but I thought it was, it had some really good moments. And I thought the, the three dogs who played Lulu were fantastic actors. I agree. They were terrific performers. Couldn't yeah. ask for more. <laughs> yes. I have a, um, I know someone who breeds Belgian Malinois, like those, the, the type of dog that Lulu is. And I know there was some movie, um, that released a few years ago. I can't remember. I feel like Robbie and Mel might have been in it. Whatever. But it had a Belgian Malinois dog in it. Or no, Kate Morrow was in it. This doesn't matter. This doesn't matter. There's a Belgian uh, Malinois dog. I know exactly what you're talking about. Megan right? Levy? Yeah. Um. Anyway. And she was like, she had to go on Facebook and be like, please do not get these dogs. If you're looking for a family pet, just because there was a nice movie with a cute dog in it please they're like professional dogs she does the whole like she has people in the suits and like her dogs will go and and bite their arms and it's crazy it's crazy um anyway but they're very good dogs they did a great job i was very proud of them they're they're very good girls um why don't you tell everybody where they can follow you on social media and all your writing and everything that you're doing well um you can follow me at Anna F. Harrison on Twitter and at Anna F. Harrison on Instagram. Very creative in my handles. And uh, you can find me at drinkinthemovies.com slash tag slash Anna dash Harrison. And also at Anna F. Harrison.com. Yes, I think that people could probably just search Anna Harrison on the website and no, find you a lot easier. Oh, well, on the website, yeah. If you just yeah. Google Anna Harrison, though, it's a first lady. No, um, I mean the search yeah. feature on on Drink in the Movies site. I think that'll take everybody to your but stuff. If you just wanted to go straight there, yeah, you know, you got it. All right. Well, thank you for joining me so much. And until next time, this was great. Yay! Thank you. Run, go, get to the chopper. We have to go. I'm coming with you. That was brilliant.